I give a lot of speeches, uh, particularly this month for some reason I find myself giving a lot of speeches. And my husband, who's here with me tonight, will tell you honestly that nothing has made me more excited than this one because there's nothing I care about more or as personally as women in management. So thanks to you for having this banquet. And for inviting me to be part of it. I particularly like the topic, Faces of Change, because I stand here deeply believing that we still have a lot to change. So let's start there. Why is change needed for women in the first place? What needs to change for a group like this to fulfill its mission? I don't think it's possible to address the topic without acknowledging that with any perspective, any global perspective, any historical perspective, a lot of change has happened. So when you think about the world my mother grew up in, where the only job options she thought existed were nursing or teaching, or where the woman who moved to the block, and this is a true story, caused a big ruckus by explaining to all the other women that they didn't need their husband's permission to get their ears pierced. You have to imagine that things, and appreciate that things have really changed. And I stand here today at the GSB knowing that with any global perspective, I'm so lucky to be here, and so is everyone else. Whether you were born in this country or just lucky enough to be educated here, we live in a world where China has such a preference for boys that there are 32 missing girls and selective kidnappings of young boys happening on a wide basis. And in Pakistan, they passed a law in the last month making it legal to rape your wife. And in the Congo, somewhere between 200,000 and 500,000 women have been raped in what is a new form of genocide the world has not seen before. So we're lucky to be here and we should talk about the change that's needed with the perspective of, in so many ways, how damn good it really is. But change is still needed. Last week I was in New York, and I spent a couple hours uh, at a firm doing a meeting, and it was me and five men at the table, which is something I would never have noticed because it happens all the time, except that when the meeting broke for like the bathroom break, the person hosting the meeting didn't know where the woman's bathroom was in his own office. And I looked at him and said, really? And he said, yeah, and I said, congratulations, you just made the speech I'm giving next week at Stanford. <laughs> and, and I promise not to mention you by name. This poor guy was so embarrassed. And I looked at him and I said, how long have you been in this office? And he said, about a year. And I said, have no other women been here in these meetings? And he thought about it and he said, I guess not. Or maybe they didn't have to use the bathroom. Women make up 16% of the corporate officer positions in this country, 15% of the board seats. Women, on average, across the population earn 80% of what men earn, even though they earn 60% of the bachelor degrees. Two Sundays ago in the Wall Street Journal, if people saw it, there was a list of the top 30 wage earners in the country. There was one woman on that list, Andrea Young. Thank God she's always on the list, number 23. Now, Jennifer's here, and she's an expert in happiness, and I know we all know that wage earning does not equate happiness, but that list is not about the, 20, you know, the top 30 wage earners. That list is about power and influence in the workplace and who is leading organizations. And of the top 30, there was only one woman. And I think even more importantly, if you define, I don't know how to define having it all, but if you think about the option to both have a career and a family, that is where men have so many more options than women to this day. This day, there's tons of data on this, but one study I recently saw was one of 160,000 PhD recipients, and they looked at those who got tenure, and of the tenured scientists, 70% of the men were married and 44% of the women. That type of statistic is rampant. When you look at women that are successful in careers, they are much less likely to be married, have children stay married than are men. So this is why change is needed. Change is needed to equal out these numbers so that more women can run institutions and that so more women can have the choice of doing both. So how can we change this? I think when people talk about change, they always often talk about big societal changes. But as Jennifer started to talk about, change happens one individual at a time. And if this is going to change, it's going to change because of the decisions individual people in this room and out of this room make. And so I want to say at the outset that I don't pretend I have all the answers and I don't pretend that my choices should be yours. I'm making a choice. I'm making a choice to work what is a very full-time job and try to be the mother of two kids and have a husband and be a wife. That's not a choice for everyone. 
So the advice I'm giving you tonight comes with no judgments. It doesn't say you must stay in the workforce, but it's advice how to stay in the workforce. That if you are one of the people that looks at that and says, yes, I want that too, or at least I want the option of that, I came here with, just like Jennifer, three pieces of advice. One, pretend you're a guy. Two, <laughs> three pieces of advice, sorry. One, pretend you're a guy. Two, don't leave until you leave. And three, make your partner a real partner. So first, pretend you're a guy. I took a class in college called the, Econom um, the in Intellectual History of, the Euro of Europe or something like that. And uh, obviously college is now a long time ago. And I took this class with my college roommate, Carrie. And Carrie was, a, was and is a brilliant literature student, went on to be a tenured professor at Columbia in the field. And the other person who took the course with us was my brother. We were seniors. He was a sophomore. He was busy playing water polo and studying pre-med, was not a literature maven the way she was. So Carrie went to all the lectures, and she read all the books in the original, the original French, the original Latin. This was her field. I, went to, I would say 90% of the lectures and read all the books in the English. My brother went to two lectures and read one book of the 13. Marched himself up to our room a couple days before the exam to get tutored. So now we're all prepared for the exam, each in our own way. The three of us went to the exam, and we all looked at each other and said afterwards, how'd you do? And Carrie said, you know, I think I did okay, but I'm not sure I fully explained the Hegelian dialectic. And I said, I felt my essay one was better than essay two because I really didn't explore Kant's categorical imperative. And my brother said, I got the flat one. Like, the flat what? He's like, the flat A. I got the flat A. Given our different levels of preparation for the exam, that was a striking amount of self-confidence. So studies show this over and over. Actually, studies show that if you ask men and women about their GPAs, women will systematically underestimate, men will systematically overestimate. And more importantly, and this is really important, when you ask women and men why they're succeeding, women will ascribe their to success, to effort or temporal things, to luck, to having worked hard, to having other people help them. Men ascribe their success to their own great talent and skill. <laughs> and women negotiate less, particularly on their own behalf. This is true. Women are four times less likely to negotiate the salary for an entry-level job. And when you multiply that over a lifetime, by the age of 50, the average woman has earned half a million dollars left, less. That's based on the average salary, not a GSB salary. So do the math for yourselves and make sure you negotiate. Why does this matter? Who cares if men are more sure of themselves, more self-confident, or women negotiate less? It matters for careers. It matters deeply in order to advance in a career or to really get the jobs you want, that you have the confidence that you know that you can do it. It matters deeply that when something is successful, the person who reaches their hand out for the next challenge believes that they had something to do with that success. And over time, how much you're paid in a job is actually correlated with success at all, because as well, because companies value and look at that as your measure of success. So your salary matters too. I want to say that this is really hard advice to follow for women. Because the other thing that the data shows, and this is what the data shows most strongly, I learned this from Deborah Grunfeld, a Stanford professor, is that success and likability are negatively correlated for women and positively correlated for men. So that for men, as you're more successful, people like you more. And with women, success and things that you do well, it's not correlated with being liked more. And so when people talk about women wanting to be liked, of course they do. And it's harder, and they're more influence on it. Well, I don't know if that's genetics or that's raising, but maybe it's just that success is less correlated with that. So women intrinsically know they have to work harder. The famous case on this, which I know you study here, but is worth remembering again and again, is the Heidi Roizen case. A professor from Stanford and Columbia, for those of you who don't know the case, took this case, it's one I read in business school, about a woman who uses her personal network to be a successful VC. And they changed it and made it Howard Roizen, and they gave it out to groups of students, men and women. And then they polled them. How competent is Howard? How competent is Heidi? Turns out they're just about as competent. But how much do you like Howard or how much do you like Heidi? How much do you trust Howard and trust Heidi? Turns out that Howard's really trustworthy and Heidi's not. And you want to spend your weekends with Howard but not Heidi. And that's a really big deal. And I actually think that, you know, I know Heidi now. And when she heard this, she said the same thing I did was, wow. And maybe I kind of knew that. 
But isn't that amazing? And maybe for those of us who are in the workforce or women who aren't yet, we kind of know that, which is why taking ownership of our success, feeling it and owning it is so hard. But I'm here to tell you that if you want to stay in the workforce, pretend you're a guy. In the quiet moments where you're not sure you deserved what really happened, think about my brother. He deserved the flat one. <laughs> and in the moments where you're not sure you can take the next job, remember that the guy next to you who probably doesn't even have the same skills, he's damn sure he can, and he's going to raise his hand. So at those moments, raise your hand and pretend you're a guy. And most importantly, negotiate for yourself. I give speeches on this, but even for me, this has been an issue. My brother-in-law, who along with my husband has been by far the most important source of support for my career, helped me a lot on this. I was looking at a job many years ago, and I was, got an offer, and I thought, huh, that's a pretty nice offer. I'm pretty lucky to get this job. I should take this. And he was like, no, no, you've got to negotiate. I was like, but I can't negotiate. This is like a great offer. I negotiate a little. I went back to him like, well, they moved, you know, 5%. And he said, I said, isn't that great? And he said, God damn it, Cheryl, why are you going to get paid half of what any man is going to get paid in this job? And that was motivating. <laughs> and had he not said that, I would have gotten paid half. And it's worth remembering that. Negotiate. Don't take a job and get paid half of what your male counterparts are going to get paid. Number two, don't leave until you leave. If you remember nothing else that I say tonight, please remember this, because this is the thing that right now is really driving me nuts, because it just keeps happening, and it keeps happening to women I feel like I've mentored. I think people who want to stay in the workforce, particularly women wanting to have kids, are making decisions too early to slow down, and they're doing it in the name of staying in the workforce, which ironically back backfires. So people start thinking about having kids or having families at different points in time. Some people think a year out, two years out. In my favorite example, a couple weeks ago, a woman at Facebook came to talk to me, and she looked a little young. So I said, so are you like thinking of having kids? She was like, no, but I want to think ahead. I'm like, OK. And then I'm trying to like, well, is your husband talking about this? She's like, well, I don't have a husband. It turned out she didn't have a boyfriend. But she thought maybe one day she would think about it. I would encourage you, please, don't think out that far. It's not going to help you. But, I certainly never did. But here's what happens. You're married, you're thinking about having a child, and you're overwhelmed with life because all of our jobs are hard, and you're doing everything you can just to keep up. So you think to yourself, God, I'm going to start trying to get pregnant, or maybe I'm trying, or I'm going to start in the next year or two. I couldn't possibly take on more. So you don't. You don't take the promotion. You don't take the next step. You don't look for the lateral move. You stay where you are because you're almost comfortable, so you feel like, well, now I'm in a place where I could have a kid. Then what happens? It takes time to get pregnant. And even if it doesn't, you're nine months away from having a baby. And then you go on maternity leave for three months. And then, especially with a first kid, it takes a good three to nine months to get back into the workforce and just feel OK. Now it's at a minimum two years later. More likely, it's three years later. And you're leaving a child every day to go to work. And you're bored because you've been in the same job for six years. Because three years ago, when it was time to change jobs, you didn't do it because you wanted to stay comfortable. Or you look around, and you're leaving your kid at home, and you're three or four years behind all of your peers, getting paid less working for someone that you used to work with. And so you leave. You leave because you're bored. You're not learning. You're not advancing. Why leave a kid for that? I'm not telling everyone to stay in the workforce. I really promise. I think there are lots of great reasons to slow down, and there are real costs to bear for being in. But if you want to stay, don't slow down in advance. And if you slow down in advance, and everyone I know who's done this does it with the express purpose of, I want to stay in the workforce, so I'll slow down, or I want to stay in the workforce so I won't take the promotion, watch them. They work just as hard in that year before they get pregnant or that month as they would have anyway. But by virtue of making that decision, they've sowed the seeds of their eventual departure. And I've seen this over and over and over. So if you want to stay in the workforce, don't slow down until you have to. Don't leave until you leave. Point number three, make your partner a real partner. And I'll talk about this with me and my husband, men and women, but this applies to partnerships of any form, you know, women together, men together, or any, any kind of domestic partner, particularly where you're raising a kid. I think this is actually the number one thing that needs to change. 
If you look at the progress we've made as a society in the workplace, it's much bigger than that we've made in the home. In my business school class, I know of three women from my section who are still working. And every single one I know who's left has left for exactly the same reason. They had two jobs. The numbers show this in very striking form. If there's a couple and a woman stays home and a man works, on average, the woman does 35 hours of household housework a week and the man does 10. If they both work, the woman does 28 and the man does 15. And if they both work, the woman does 3.5 times the amount of childcare in terms of hours as the man does. So women are leaving the workforce because they're pulled home, but they're not just pulled home because they want to be. And they're certainly not pulled home for my least favorite re reason, women nurse so they're more attached to women, which is such, to their children, which is such BS. They're pulled home because they're doing two jobs. And two jobs is really hard. And so if we want this to change, if you want to stay in the workforce, and this is for the men who are here as well as the women, it has to become more even. Now, becoming more even is hard. When I was about to have my first child uh, a little over four years ago, there was a woman who was at a business school and was doing her PhD dissertation. I was about seven months pregnant. And she found me to ask me all about like, how I did it all. And I'm on the phone saying, well, I don't do it all. I don't even have kids yet. And then she starts asking me all these detailed questions. Well, what are you going to do? Are you going to do this? Who's going to take the child to school? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? And you know, I never admit I cry in public because I believe women shouldn't, even though, look, I've cried at work, everyone has. Um, I'm on the end of the phone by the end crying, thinking, oh my God, I am two months away from having a child. And my husband and I have never talked about this. So I go home and I see Dave, oh my God, we're having a baby in two months, kid could come early and we've never talked about this. And he looks at me and he's like, this is all we talk about. <laughs> True story, he's here tonight, you can ask him. But this is really hard. My mother says, you don't marry the right person, you become the right person. I think she says that because she was lucky enough to marry the right person. I believe both. I believe you marry the right person, and I did, and he supported me every step of the way. And without that, there is zero chance I'd be standing here tonight. But you also become the right person. And you become the right person about, with talking about this, you become the right person with understanding the trade-offs you make. There's a very well-documented power dynamic in couples that the person who earns more makes more of the household decisions. It's true in lesbian couples, it's true with men who are gay couples, and it's true with men and women, so it's usually the man. And it's also the case that studies show where household, households where men do half the housework and women earn half the money have half the divorce rate, which is pretty incredible. But if you want to stay in the workforce, marry the right guy, if you want a wife who stares in the, stays in the workforce, understand this and remember how important this is and how hard you're going to have to work to make this real because society isn't going to help you and the example your friends are, your friends are there aren't going to help you. In all of this, I want to make it clear that I don't think it's that men are lazy, even though some Sunday football watching kind of points in that direction. <laughs> I think the real issue is not just making more choices for women, but making more choices for men. Last week, as I mentioned, I was in New York, and I was talking to this woman who's very senior in an investment bank, and we're talking about the layoffs. And she said, it's amazing how much harder it's hitting the men than the women. Because for the men, it's their whole identity and their failures if they get laid off. And for the women, it never quite was. And then she said something really interesting, which is that she said one of the reasons she thinks she's stayed in the workforce, she's been in investment banking 30 years as a woman, she has very few peers, is because she had to work. Work sometimes comes with bad choices, and work sometimes comes with some BS you have to put up with. And her friends had the choice to leave, but she didn't. She didn't have the choice to leave because she had to support her family because her husband was a public servant. So she put up with it, and she stayed. And in staying, she got to a really great place. And those two things together showed you that for all kinds of reasons, in some ways, women have more choices than men. And so if we want to change this, we have to make it either more part of women's identity, what the work they're doing inside or outside the home, or less a part of men's. Just as we want partners who do half the work, we shouldn't demand that our partner's self-esteem is based on their professional success. And I know only a few men who have tried to stay home with kids full-time, and it is really hard. There is no support, there is no nothing that comes with it. The other moms don't want to play. When I take time off and go with my kid to a class, 
I always hang out with the dad if I can find one in the class because someone needs to do that. And we have to make it okay, not just for women to have choices, but for men. And I think that's beholden on all of us. I'm turning 40 in a couple months. I've been thinking this a lot because it's, you know, kind of a big deal. And because my girlfriends and I, the ones I grew up with, planned a trip for our 40th birthday many years ago when that seemed like really far away. And we're going in like 10 days. And this made me think about kind of the passing of generations. And I think my generation has made some progress. I think we'll continue to make more. But I don't believe my generation is going to take this far enough, because in my age and my cohort, there aren't enough of us left working in the workforce. So we pass the torch to you. We pass it to Naomi Gleet, who's here with me tonight, and, and Sarah Smith, who are stars at Facebook, who are working all the time to internationalize our site and to run our ad sales program. And we pass it to the people in this class, to Patty Buckley and Samer and Shalom Falouf, who are the people like you guys who are going to make a difference as women, and to the men, to Aldo King and Spencer Smith. Gloria Steinem always says that any man who comes to an event like this gets a nice pass when the inevitable feminist revolution comes. So congratulations. <laughs> congratulations for being here tonight. But the torch we passed really matters. I think about my daughter, I want more choices for her. My two nieces, I look at the three little girls playing, and they play house, and they play cars, and they play trains, and I wonder what kind of choices we're going to create. And I want more choices for my son, both choices, the choice to work and the choice to stay home. And I submit to all of you that it is going to be the choices that we as individuals make that create those choices for them. So I'm glad Stanford Business School has this banquet every year. I'm particularly glad that it's called Faces of Change. And I look forward to your faces being the faces of change in the future. Thank you.